Hi there. Welcome everyone to this um, episode of um, Totally Unscripted. So this episode, we're, we're looking at what's next in um, Google Apps Script. So uh, hopefully you're aware that uh, Google Cloud Next was um, held recently, um, last month, I think it was. Um, and there were a number of sessions um, dedicated to, to Google Apps Script. So we thought it'd be useful to come together and um, just talk about those, see what's coming up. We'll share a link to this uh, slide deck so you can get um, access to all the, the links um, after after the, the show. Uh, but you know, there was a, a lot of lot of sessions um, at Next. But Romain, how how does this compare to previous events? Did you feel it was a, a bumper a bumper conference for App Script? Uh, yes, totally. So, uh, in fact, it was the it's the first time that uh, Google is really serious about uh, this uh, next event. Um, there was a next event uh, last year, but it was really not so crowded. Um, uh, this year, we had uh, yes, uh, ten thousand people, so pretty much like Google I/O. Uh, but uh, if you've been at Google I/O, uh, during the uh, last years, uh, you might have noticed that uh, there were uh, no session at all about app scripts. Um, and so it was very good to have an event dedicated to uh, Google Cloud and J Suite. Uh, and as uh, part of this event, uh, app scripts was um, really present with uh, seven sessions. I've counted maybe other sessions already men uh, also mentioned app script, uh, but those seven sessions were um, uh, focused on, on app script. And um, so first, um, it was interesting to, uh, well, people who were there were able to uh, meet with app script, new app script product manager, uh, Paul McReynolds, um, who um, made a nice presentation um, so that everybody can uh, quickly see what we can do with App Script. Uh, so that's the first uh, link in the presentation in the slide we are seeing now. Um, and af at the end of the session, uh, he was uh, nice enough to uh, announce the roadmap. Um, so uh, we will um, uh, talk a bit more about that, but. Uh, it's nice uh, for once uh, to have uh, uh, some information about uh, the uh, future of App Script. And speaking about the future, the fact that we've seen uh, seven different sessions on App Script at Next uh, is also um, a quite good message for the future of App Script. Uh, we've seen that many, many people uh, at, from Google uh, were talking about App Script, and many, many uh, G Suite customers uh, were uh, also uh, discussing it. Um, so uh, about the presentation, uh, we will uh, talk a bit about uh, slice add-ons uh, that were uh, introduced uh, during another session, uh, new Google Docs integration to streamline your workflows. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about that. Uh, Gmail add-ons also, uh, and if you want to look at all the uh, app script videos uh, from Google Next, uh, I will also recommend uh, the session um, uh, building G Suite add-ons with Google App Script, uh, where there was uh, Daniel Flory uh, as guest speaker, and he talked about uh, uh, Ultradox. Uh, Ultradox is a, a product he's uh, managing, and it's not uh, a totally uh, app script product, but it's uh, it has many add-ons. Uh, in fact, one add-on for docs, one for sheets, one for forms, um, letting you um, be, letting him better integrate uh, his Ultradox application uh, with uh, the uh, Google Apps. Um, Sheets, Docs, and Forms. Uh, and I already recommend his presentation. Uh, as an add-on developer or as, as an app script developer, you will see how to um, nicely integrate your app within uh, Docs editors. 
uh, and it's also quite fun uh, his demo to see everything you can do with a, a tool like Ultradox using a lot of different uh, Google APIs. Um, if you are an advanced app script developer, I would also recommend uh, my own talk. Uh, I've been a guest speaker at the event and I talk about um, using uh, Google Stack Driver uh, to log errors and other uh, events um, from App Script uh, to monitor and uh, get some statistics about the uh, usage of uh, your add-on or your uh, web app or uh, whatever you've been, you've been building with App Script. Um, it's a bit advanced uh, as not every App Script developers uh, need, need that, uh, but uh, it's interesting to see uh, the possible integration with App Script and the rest of the Google Cloud Platform. Um, and the other talks are uh, mostly interesting um, if you want to see other examples of uh, uh, building um, uh, integration between uh, different uh, Google services using App Script. That's all. It's, it's uh, what, what's um, nice to see as well that, that you know there were a range of sessions so um, for for beginners as well um, up to to advances as, um, as you mentioned. You mentioned the roadmap, so um, let's move on to that. So there was um, as Romain mentioned, um, Paul, the new uh, product. Uh, manager for um, App Scripts um, basically gave an over overview. So if you haven't seen the session, he actually put huge disclaimers at the beginning of it to say um, this is session and there is no guarantees of this. Anything in particular um, from um, uh, uh, from you, Steve, that that jumped out from from the roadmap? Oh, I mean, a few things. Um, the Gmail add-ons. I thought that was a, a new innovative way of presenting. Um, in App Script, the simplicity of how to integrate Gmail add-ons specifically. And to see that release this year, I, I wasn't sure about that. So mm -hmm. it's slated, uh, again, with a disclaimer. Um, <laughs> so I was glad to see that, because I'm not sure if they're planning to do something similar for other add-ons, because that is the unique framework they're using. I, I thought the um, the reference to export um, more explicit OAuth scopes was quite interesting. Um, are 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 you facing some of the problems I have with people? You know, when they get that um, OAuth flow going up and it's you know requesting access to your entire drive, are you feeling that pain? <laughs> uh yeah, a bit. Um, for me, it's um, mostly interesting. For example, um, recently I've published a new add-on, uh, which is using the very old um, Picasa Web Album API, yeah. uh, which is still the official uh, Google Photo API, um, and um, because there's no um, connector, native connector, or advanced service in App Script uh, to interact with this API, I need to use your fetch for that. Uh, but if I'm able to add the scope for the Picasa API uh, directly in App Script, it means that uh, people won't have to re-authenticate uh, uh, click on a new authorized button and so on, and I will be. Uh, it will be possible to use a URL fetch directly with the uh, OS token from App Script rather than handling my own OS flow, and that's um, for me. It's really great value. How about you, Spencer? Is the was there anything? Have you had the yeah, chance to that, see? Yeah, actually. That was one of the, the, the explicit OAuth scopes is probably one of the things I'm pretty excited about also. Um, because you're right, as, Ro, as Romain talked about, is, you know, uh, when you can't force a specific scope into your project, you have to start rolling your own OAuth, which uh, gives you, you know, it gives you two different consent screens at the, 
that the users have to go through instead of just a single one when they install it. Um, and also when you when it's going through the app marketplace, you, they don't explicitly get those OAuth scopes. Um, if you even if you're if you're adding a click event to 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 that, so if being able to add very specific OAuth scopes to your project that you want that they would ask for at the beginning is something that I think has been really needed for a long time. And um, I suppose one of the kind of trends you can pick out from the roadmap is, to me anyway, it looks like becoming more enterprise friendly. I don't, Bruce, do, do you, you know, this is probably more of your your territory. Do, would you agree with that? Or um, do you think it's still um, app script user centric? Yeah, um, so it's funny that you are mentioning that uh, uh, it's becoming more and more enterprise friendly because um, if I remember well, uh, most of the features um, that we are seeing on the roadmap uh, dedicated to enterprises uh, will in fact uh, be only included uh, uh, in uh, G Suite business. Uh, uh, the uh, standard version of uh, G Suite. So you will have to pay a bit more to be able to uh, have those kind of uh, dashboards um, for admins or for end users. I suppose. Can, can you, hear, can you yeah. hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce, on you go. I, actually, I, I would completely agree with what Romain just said. I was just I was about to say, um, <laughs> I think we're going to see two streams. Um, we're going to see the things that are. Um, somehow more professional, if you like, um, and the stuff that I would say the hobbyist would be more interested in, which is some of the territory that App Script has been occupying up till now. Um, one of the things that struck me from the roadmap, and I think it's really good, um, is the professionalization of the development environment. I, f I feel as if you're going to be able to get more, um, you know, proper build build chains, if you like, tool chains to, to build your app that we don't have today. And it feels it feels very amateur trying to create a project that's more than just um, a container-bound script. You know, you have to do all kinds of weird stuff. Um, and that's not how people develop nowadays. Um, it, it, it is how people develop for doing little things with spreadsheets, but it's not how enterprises develop. So I think that, you know, the two things go hand in hand. If you are going to Come up with something that's kind of like aimed at business users, and there'll be a pr maybe potentially even a premium for. Um, you also have to provide the professional tools on the back end to make you be able to build robust stuff, because you couldn't you couldn't do it with the tools that we have today. So that was one of the great things I saw on the uh, on the roadmap. And in fact, when we went when we went to the meeting in back in November as well, when we talked about that too, I thought that was a really good uh, development. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned about the OAuth flow. I think that's been missing from the beginning. I mean, just being able to to add a scope that you need without having to go into a whole world of complication, I think, is 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 really good too. Well, um, so we're going to go into some of the um, the worst sessions dedicated to some of the the things mentioned on the roadmap. So. One of those was the the Gmail's add-on. So this this what I think is quite interesting about the Gmail add-on uh, announcement is the fact that it's um, it's baked in to to the platform. So it is um, coded using App Script, but you know if you pick up Gmail on Android or iOS, um, you know the the actions that you're you're coding with App Script. Are going to be there just as they would be on the desktop. I, I just wonder, from the room, with any other projects already spinning up in your mind that you you think you could tackle this? Well, well, actually, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't talk about projects specifically. What I'd rather say is the philosophical approach to it. And um, we all remember back in the early days, um, the way that you had a UI was with that UI app thing, um, and then they decided that was a little bit too limiting, and then it became, you had this problem that if you wanted to talk to the end user, you suddenly had to learn um, HTML and CSS and JavaScript and all sorts of stuff. 
um, just to, just to ask him a question, you know, and that I thought was a massive inhibitor for um, people who were just starting up. I think that you know people get started up on AppScript because it's kind of easy to get going, and then suddenly mm. you've got to ask a question, and there's a whole new world you've got to learn. Um, and I think that the approach with the Gmail add-on, um, from what I've seen of it so far, and what I've understood, is as you say, it's much more integrated. You don't have to know all those things. You don't have to be a, a, a front-end developer just to ask a simple question. And I think this will remove a tremendous barrier to adoption um, ever since the UI app went away. I wasn't a fan of the UI app, by the way, by any means. <laughs> but I, so, I think it was a big barrier for people to get started doing doing better things. So if you haven't seen the, the session for that, the, the slide here we've we've pulled from that session just shows you how you'd make a, um, a, a contact card in, in Gmail add-on. So you can see, you know, in a couple of lines of code. I just wonder, do, do you think this will be the direction Google goes in terms of add-ons for doc sheets and forms and in terms of, because currently it's a free-for-all in terms of appearance. Do you think they'll be trying to rein us in and give us a, a very fixed palette in terms of presenting well, I think, stuff? Well, I think that you'll still be able to do whatever you like, but um, this, the encouragement you get from doing things much more easily will cause them to start to look, um, which is probably a good thing because, you know, if it's an add-on to a, to a system, it should look like the system. You know, it should be part yeah. of what, what it's supposed to be an add-on to, as opposed to some um, strange, weird, and wonderful thing that we can all come up with from time to time. So, yeah, I think it's. I think it's. They're all going to eventually hone in. It's, it's like material design, the way that the way that every Google website you go to, pretty much nowadays, um, you know, it's a Google website, and you know. Um, you know, because of the 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 way you interact with with all the the widgets and so on is is standard, and the color schemes are standard. So you don't have to. I wonder how I navigate around this kind of a question whenever you arrive. And the same thing will should apply to add-ons as well. So I think it's good. But of course, the the um, underlying apps themselves, like Sheets and everything, also need to be upgraded to to be like that too, because they're not yet. So you know, I think that's that's the, I think it's a good thing. Steve, um, you're you're uh, the owner of the the uh, Google Plus add-ons community, which is booming, by the way. I think you just you went over 16k members. That, have you any thoughts on you know should add-ons for the other platforms go down this route, or do you think that's going to be too limiting, or um, any thoughts? Um, I believe I saw some communication where I'm kind of leaning towards what Bruce was saying. Yeah, this would, I think this will be available eventually, but they're not going to take away, for example, the HTML service. Yeah. Uh, as long as you um, uh, fall in line with the best practices that Google has on their documentation. Um, and also getting back to the Gmail version of this, uh, it's it's a nice, nice to have for add-ons existing in Gmail because so many users have been dependent on like extensions in the browser, like the Chrome browser. Yeah. And that was limited because you have to use the Chrome browser and extensions typically aren't used on the mobile area. So this is a, a win in many ways for the Gmail to have an add on. So that's why you're going to probably see a lot of these famous Chrome extensions for Gmail, perhaps navigating to this and maybe going away. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to uh, how this evolves. I, I was um, recently presenting to, um, uh, there's a local tech meetup for mobile developers, and I was talking about the Android add-ons that already exist. And um, it just seems that they really, you know, given the direction they've gone with Gmail add-ons, they missed a trick with the Android add-ons for docs and sheets, because it the ones I've seen, they, they, they just don't integrate it at all. That's a good point. Because it does, it does solve that problem. I mean, cross-platform, cross-browsers with a simple, uh, what can be a source of a pain point of building the UI, as Bruce stated. So mm -hmm. it's a very good point. So that's why it's hard to imagine them not rolling this uh, card technique through all add-ons. Yeah. 
Ramin, was there anything you picked up in the corridors um, after this session um, or anything from the session that, that caught your eye? Well, uh, I think mostly the uh, Gmail team was afraid that uh, if they allowed um, the HTML service, uh, it will be a mess. Um, yeah. They wanted to avoid that, so maybe they uh, put some pressure on the AppScript team to release uh, this kind of stuff. And um, at the moment, um, uh, I haven't tested uh, those add-ons yet, so I don't know how much you can do with that. But yeah. uh, if you look at the um, uh, at the uh, at the session, you will see that, uh, uh, well, it, it was a tiny bit disappointing because, in fact, uh, they, uh, they made presentation of two different add-ons uh, from uh, two CRMs, uh, Salesforce and uh, Prosperworks. And, in fact, uh, their add-ons were really exactly the same. Uh, <laughs> And so if they've built uh, this just for that, uh, it will be an issue. Uh, but uh, if you are able to do more, it, it will be interesting to, to test and see exactly how you can, uh, um, uh, what you can do with this stuff. And another interesting thing is that, uh, so uh, there's one direction where, uh, the yeah, Gmail team uh, is okay with add-ons, but wants to uh, protect its UI. Uh, and at the same time, um, if you have uh, published an add-on recently, uh, you might have seen that uh, there's no uh, review process anymore, uh, meaning that um, uh, at the uh, launch of the add-on stores, uh, there was um, well, in fact, one guy at Google, but uh, uh, there was uh, a process uh, where uh, someone at Google uh, was uh, reviewing your add-on uh, and uh, making a list of uh, adjustments, not in terms of code, uh, but in terms of uh, uh, look and feel, uh, user experience, and uh, mostly also how it integrates um, in the um, in the UI of uh, uh, the editor dot sheets or forms, uh, and uh, you add to uh, use uh, their um, CSS uh, to have uh, buttons uh, that uh, were similar to the buttons available uh, in the UI of docs and sheets and so on. And uh, now there's not that anymore. Uh, you can publish uh, uh, an add-on with a UI that is completely different from the UI you're seeing in uh, uh, Docs or Sheets, uh, it's totally OK. Um, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I suppose uh, uh, it depends on the uh, team handling that. And uh, it will be interesting to see if uh, they want to um, port this um, new um, uh, Cars framework uh, to other UIs, or if it's if if it was just a request uh, from the Gmail team, and if it will only remain uh, for uh, the Gmail UI, and that's all. I don't mm -hmm. know. Anyway, so uh, the other add-on uh, related announcement was. Um, uh, well, we've got Slides app, so um, that's already an advanced service. So that's a, a recent announcement. It's 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 there. You can start using it. We already had Slides API, but you had to do the whole um, URL fetch token, blah blah blah. Um, Add-ons is there. Do much to add about Slide add-ons? Um, uh, it's for me that. Uh, the, the the bit I want to get access to is the the presentation slide uh, side of um, of slides, not the uh, slide content generation. So this doesn't <laughs> doesn't take my box. But is there anything uh, we want to add to this, or should we just push on? 
What are you meaning like a, a UI add-on to the Slides app? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, as to, opposed for, to yeah, for yeah. the presentation mode. So, um, yeah. I, I, you know, I'd like to be able to interact with the presentation to move it forward or j jump it to a slide to change content. Yeah, uh, yeah, there, yeah. there is that. Yeah. Yeah, so you can embed stuff into Google Slides, but once you hit presentation mode, it's it's static content. Um, in my case, well, um, I I'm also working a lot uh, on uh, uh, Google Sites, and uh, one uh, uh, feature that was uh, well, it was not part of uh, Google Sites ready, but uh, um, a lot of people were. Uh, putting uh, photos in uh, Picasa slash Google Photos uh, to uh, display um, a little slideshow of photos uh, in their sites. Uh, and um, this feature has been uh, deprecated uh, by the um, uh, by the Picasa Google Photo team. Um, so I've built an add-on uh, for Google Sheets uh, that um, Take the photos uh, from a photo album and uh, uh, create a presentation uh, with one photo per slide. So you can have an, a slideshow uh, that you can put uh, in any site. And uh, I've done that in uh, Google Sheets only because I there was no uh, slides add-on. Uh, so uh, I already have an idea for a slide add-on. Um, <laughs> And uh, apart from that, um, I, I I think that yes, uh, being able to automatically update a presentation is uh, quite interesting. And uh, so I was really pleased with the release of the uh, Slides API. And uh, the more we can interact uh, with the addition of slides, the more I think uh, ideas will come to uh, uh, improve the flow and. Uh, when you when you see the uh, the time a lot of people are spending uh, simply on updating um, a presentation for um, meetings and for uh, different kind of reportings, uh, I think the automation there uh, will be uh, beneficial to a lot of people. Mm. Hey, Romain, I got a question actually about the site. So that, I don't think there was really anything said about that. Um, you know, we, we, we can't script sites yet and we can't embed stuff and everything. Is, is there anything that was spoken about at the on the on the slides to do with Google Sites? Uh, to uh, about Google Sites specifically? Yeah, because the old Google Sites, you could you could script it in, in the same way that you could share. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that uh, something that's coming? Uh, so uh, actually, uh, there was a, a session at uh, uh, Next uh, about uh, uh, roadmap for G Suite. Uh, so a lot more uh, information than uh, just uh, the roadmap from AppScript. And uh, if I uh, remember well, it's the only session not available on YouTube. <laughs> uh, but apart from that, um, there there was a mention of um, uh, some updates uh, for uh, Google Sites, but at the moment uh, they are uh, trying to uh, focus on um, needs of uh, very basic users, not advanced ones. Uh, so. I think once they will have covered uh, the basic needs of most people, uh, they will um, look at advanced stuff. Uh, but um, f f for now, yes, I, I don't think they will uh, move forward uh, with AppScript integration and so on. There's too much other work to do. But um, that's just my guess. That's all. Yeah, I think that's one of the things, um, Steve, you, you pointed out when um, we were talking about the roadmap, that there was that lack of information about um, Google Sites on it, which is really hard to interpret. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like sometimes when you look at roadmaps, you get excited while they're showing us everything. And then I realized I don't see anything about uh, Google Apps Script interacting 
<laughs> with sites and it's the new sites where we are talking about so that, yeah, yeah that, that was interesting so i appreciate roman's uh, thoughts on that um to either integration and the construction of sites or once the user's using it with an add-on experience so we'll, we'll see where it goes mm -hmm. uh, in fact what i did i wrote a, a chrome extension where you type in a keyword and while you edit the site and then when the Chrome extension wakes up, it will replace that keyword with an embedded Google Apps Script web app. I played around with that, but that's just a short, that's a very specific thing that's not mm. cross device per se, or yeah. uh, you can't use it on mobile is what I'm trying to say. Mm. <laughs> so the other announcement, so this was, um... There wasn't so there was some very excited press releases in the tech media about this um they all had the similar sort of line around uh which we've got on this slide around um uh this was related to the announcement of um hangout chats so the um, google kind of spinning out kind of a, a slack type service um uh, which replicates some of their existing services, in my opinion, which will lead to some confusion. But the interesting part was the within Hangout Chats, uh, the ability um, to to script um, bots. Which um, I got. This was an an area when um, Google Wave was out that I was really interested in having, you know, um, bits of code interacting with what was being said but um i don't remain if you want to if you're prepared to to to, to say what we we were talking about before before we went yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah um based on the um lack of information we've seen so far about that uh, i'm not even sure it's true uh when uh when we are seeing the uh uh, current uh, attempts, attempts at uh, uh, bots uh, from uh, Google. It's uh, mostly uh, Google Home and uh, the integration uh, of uh, um, long, language and uh, um, um, recognition of uh, what the user is saying or uh, texting, uh, thanks to uh, company. Have we lost Remain? Yeah, um, to kind of fill in some of the blanks, so um, Google bought a service called API.ai, which allows kind of a, you can start a conversation. So yeah, there, you know, Google have some services that they bought. We're going to talk about something else in a, in a second that kind of puts a question mark again. Um, uh, Hangout and it just might have been the timing wasn't mentioned in the roadmap session, but there's not much we can really read into that. Welcome back, Romain. I think I kind of cobbled together everything you were going to say on Hangouts. It does lead on nicely to the, the cloud function. So, um, uh, so uh, Romain, do you want to talk briefly more about this? Um, yes, uh, so I thought it was important to mention Cloud Functions uh, because we were uh, speaking about uh, the uh, next event and during uh, next they also announced the uh, beta release of Cloud Functions, meaning that uh, we already knew that uh, Cloud Functions were, uh, 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 were being released, but uh, now it's in beta, so it means that everybody can start using them. And uh, it's interesting because uh, it's um, the uh, first uh, time the uh, cloud platform is um, uh, is coming so near to AppScript, uh, meaning that uh, as AppScript, it's very very easy uh, to uh, deploy your code. Uh, on Google Cloud, um, you you need to use JavaScript on server side, uh, like AppScript, 
um, it uses uh, Node.js, so it's a bit different than AppScript, uh, but it's mostly because uh, AppScript was there, I think, before Node.js, and uh, uh, if AppScript had been invented later on, I suppose it would run on Node.js as well. Uh, and so, well, uh, it, it means that uh, it will be interesting to, to see the uh, future of both, uh, because uh, maybe at some point they will uh, do more integration or share uh, more internal stuff uh, between uh, uh, cloud functions and app scripts. Uh, because at this moment, it means that, yes, you have uh, two services um, in the uh, Google Cloud platform uh, to write um, uh, easily uh, JavaScript uh, little functions um, um, on server side, and uh, uh, that's app script and cloud functions. Um, for app script developers, I think it's interesting to uh, know cloud functions because uh, if they are afraid to use uh, other more uh, complex stuff uh, than app script, um, while well, uh, moving or starting to use cloud function in addition to app script is uh, quite easy. It's still JavaScript. Uh, you are uh, still uh, doing that in the Google environment, uh, and it's very easy to deploy. Uh, but it's infinitely more scalable, uh, meaning that if you are um, struggling uh, with some uh, intensive uh, task uh, with app script, um, maybe it would make sense uh, to port your code or part of your code uh, to cloud functions. Um, I know that uh, Bruce uh, mentioned uh, a while ago that uh, maybe it was time to update the uh, URL fetch quota uh, in app script. Uh, and I agree with him, uh, but they haven't done so, at least yet. Uh, and so in that case, if you uh, need to do a lot of uh, URL fetch uh, calls uh, with your uh, with your app. Maybe it makes sense to uh, move that part of your code to cloud functions. Bruce, uh, was there anything you wanted to add to that? No, I, I would agree with uh, everything that Romain just said. I think it's a great uh, opportunity for again the professionalization of what we were talking about earlier. Cloud functions have been around for. Um, a long time with other providers, parse.com parse notably. Um, if you remember, they were around when, when the script DB went away, and then we were encouraged to use parse.com as an alternative. Um, it's gone away itself now, but it didn't reduce uh, cloud functions as part of part of its environment. And of course, Firebase has got them as well. Um, I always get a bit confused about Firebase and Google Cloud because they kind of seem to be the same thing except called something different sometimes. So I'm not, I haven't quite got my mind around um, if they're going to be the same thing or if they're, you know, if if one is behind the other or uh, as in the case of, um, you know, cloud storage for example is really just cloud storage although it's Firebase storage as well sometimes. So you know, I'm I'm a little bit confused as to that kind of differentiation maybe other people know but in any case it's the same thing you've got some cloud functions that you can subcontract your local processing to which is which is which is going to be great um, I don't know how it's going to work in terms of uh, charging one assumes that you this is a billable thing is it Romain you would know uh, yes uh, yeah. so there's a huge free quota um, more than uh, I don't know two million requests per uh, they are months. I, I don't remember, uh, okay. but uh, you have a, a huge quota, uh, a huge free quota, and yeah. uh, it's also uh, uh, quite cheap to to use uh, intensively. Um, I, I, I well, the competition is already there, uh, mainly uh, Amazon Lambda, and yeah. uh, I, yeah. I suppose uh, Google wanted to uh, uh, invest the market and they. Yeah, for for cheap. Um, about the uh, um, cloud function and Firebase function, it's uh, it's funny because uh, so uh, during before the uh, launch of uh, Firebase uh, of cloud function for Firebase, uh, uh, Firebase uh, was talking about 
Firebase functions. And in fact, they decided uh, not to go live with this name. So uh, you will not see Firebase functions, uh, but you will see uh, cloud functions for Firebase. Uh, I suppose there's a small battle between the uh, cloud and the Firebase team. Uh, it's my product. No, it's my product. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so now it's uh, m more clear than uh, that uh, uh, it's only an integration uh, between a Firebase and Cloud Function uh, so that uh, your uh, uh, real time database, for example, uh, can automatically, automatically trigger a Firebase func uh, Cloud Function. Um, without uh, any work on your side. So I think I think this is uh, this is interesting because you know many times people have said, hey, why can't I get more more uh, time on AppScript um, if I pay for it? That's been always been a question since the beginning. Um, why can't I get more quota if I'm willing to pay for it? Well, I think the answer is is here now. I think you you're not going to need you're not going to need much more time on AppScript if you can delegate. A lot of the work you do to cloud functions, right? Uh, in a way, but uh, cloud functions are uh, only uh, meant for uh, a lot of small tasks. So yeah. you won't be able to you uh, to make a very uh, long running task uh, on cloud functions. But uh, you can start uh, thousands of uh, um, um, of little uh, little tasks. Yeah, uh, absolutely. In, in yeah, yeah, and they're going to run probably a bit faster as well. So I, th I think the opportunity for delegation, parallel delegation, in fact, is going to get do away with some of the need that people feel they have for long run yeah. sort of stuff. And uh, one of the uh, nice advantages of cloud functions over um, AppScript is that uh, in AppScript, when you're doing uh, URL fetch. Uh, calls, uh, those are uh, synchron calls. Uh, so uh, the rest of your code will uh, stop until uh, you are fetch uh, reset an answer. And it's uh, not the case in Cloud Functions, where uh, it's totally asynchronous. Uh, and so uh, you can start uh, different tasks and uh, uh, use uh, premises uh, like you can on uh, the client side. One of the questions we got from the YouTube chat is, uh, we've talked little functions here. How, how you know, what have we got any uh, details on how much code code can be a cloud function? Sorry, uh, what what's the limit to? We've talked about a little function, uh, but um, how many lines of code approximately? Oh, no, no, no. It's not in terms of uh, lines of code. It, it's uh, simply a matter of uh, uh, the uh, time uh, Cloud Function can run. And I, I think it's uh, not more than app scripts. Um, right. Yeah. But uh, if you want to have a, a very uh, big code uh, on Cloud Functions, you, you can easily um, do that. It's, yeah, you're so not restricted in terms of lines of code. Yeah, so I, I can imagine a whole uh, ecosystem of uh, useful functions that people will be writing and sharing in the way that we share libraries today. Uh, and if you if you already use Node, you'll know the NPM yeah. uh, environment where you can find code to do almost anything uh, that already exists. And that so suddenly that opens up, in my mind, all the things you can do on Node with functions people already written in NPM. Uh, available to you as something you can do from app script. Um, obviously, it's going to need some synchronization and organization, but I think it's a tremendous uh, for many things that you wouldn't have been able to think of doing before on app script. Not just about the time it takes to execute and stuff, but the you know people have spent many hours writing very clever things that you don't have to write again. So I think that's that that's the key the key to it. And also, you if you use App Engine. You probably have noticed that nowadays you can run Node on App Engine as well, so you've got a kind of a you've got a migrate a migration path if you like. If you start on App Script, you can start to do a, a few things on Node. Um, 
as you start to like it, you can start to move your entire application to Node, and you can host it on App Engine. So I can see, you can see how all that stuff starts to fit together. Um, so something to underline that this is in beta now. So um, for people watching, you can there's documentation on on the website, so you can get the details on the quotas and um, start looking at uh, the reference material for that. Um, you may have seen that on the Google developer site that there is a, a new issue tracker for App Script. Um, so uh, there's more information about that. The good thing is the, the documentation, um, sorry, the, the previous tickets have been migrated into here. So if you had an old ticket, um, you, you, you should be able to find it. Well, you should be able to find it. It's probably the... <laughs> The, the choice words here because it's slightly different in terms of you know it's it's this is basically the issue tracker Google have uh, used internally but they've now kind of turned it uh, they've made some of it public facing as well um, so how, how have you guys been navigating the issue tracker have you, have you found because it's got <laughs> all the issues it's it's Funneling it down into App Script takes a bit of um, getting used to, it. or is that just me? <laughs> well, I don't know if you noticed, you probably all got a million emails in the past couple of days from all yes. the. Yeah. So that was someone. I think that was someone tidying up the uh, stuff that had been around for for ages. So in terms of being able to find stuff, um, personally, I've always just followed the links to the millions of emails I've had. I've never started <laughs> from scratch, so well, I guess I'll find out. <laughs> How about you, Steve? Um, have you had time to play with the tracker? Uh, just to the level that you mentioned, where it's yeah. <laughs> you got you got to uh, be very specific in the search, the search string, and to find things. So yeah, you can set up things like save searches, which um, I think are essential, or you you're just going to be going in circles for quite a while. You can still star stuff as well. So um, I don't know. Do we know Google? Well, it, it was unclear if Google were using the stars as a. They said they were in terms of what got priority fixes, but do we do we think that's true? Would should we keep starring stuff anyway? Yeah. <laughs> Is that? Yeah, I think you should certainly star stuff. Um, whether whether or not it led to. Um, preferential treatment, I couldn't really say. There's a lot of stuff with hundreds of stars that are open and the stuff that have been closed with, you know, one star. So I think a lot of it's got to do with how difficult it is as well. You know, if something's easy to do, you're going to do it, right? If something's yeah. complicated and it's got loads of stars, maybe we'll get around to that. So yeah. I think they do. They, you, you would think, you would hope that they, would, they were use, using that as some kind of guide. But, you know, it's, it's also... Right? You know, a number of times I've used the issue tracker to find out why something isn't working to discover that there's already an ex existing ticket on it is um, something just to highlight. Well, that in itself is very useful, actually, because, um, you know, when something isn't working and you don't know why, you can spend an awful lot of time trying to figure out why only to realize that someone's already noticed it. So you can get all your life, right? So I think that's pretty <laughs> So um, last, we, we got uh, 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 an audience question. So I'll, we have a, a totally unscripted show site, and I'll include the links at the end. And there's opportunities for uh, feedback and submitting questions. But I thought we'd spend it a couple of moments on, on this question. So um, it's about around cash service. Um, yeah, I'll take that one. Yeah. But how how long have we got? <laughs> Quick answer. So there's um, you can't talk about cash service without talking about property service because they're very similar and very very related. Um, so I think the question is something to do with when when should you use cash, right? Something along those lines. Um, well, talk about what cash is first of all. It's it's a piece of storage that you access by a key, um, and you write some string data to it, which would probably be a stringified object actually. Um, and in fact, what so it, it can live for up to six hours, I think. 
uh, and on purpose it's meant to be ephemeral so it'll go away after some period of time um, and so it's not there for something to refer to uh, tomorrow it's there for storing something for a short period of time and there's a good reason for that it's because you would typically use it if you were for example going to um, an API and getting a whole bunch of data um, and maybe you're going to go to that API again later on it'd be good if you'd stored that somewhere um, so that when you come back to it not necessarily even in the same run but in the same script in an hour's time or something you might be able to avoid going back to that API if it's already some something that you've stored in cache under some key that you've made it up that you've made up now cache can only store 100k I think is the is the maximum um, the good thing is it do doesn't count towards your quota so what that means is that if you URL fetch as you know has got a quota if you've got loads of URL fetches to do apart from it being quicker to get it from cache you're also not using up your quota to get it from cache so that's a good thing um, cache is specific to a script and within that you can make it specific to a particular user or to a particular document um, so that means that you can't use caches across scripts you can only use them within the same script doesn't mean within the same session but it means within the same script. Now, property services is different than that. Property service can hold a much smaller amount of data, but it, can, it holds it forever. So the two differences are that your property service, you keep things in you're going to need many times, like um, keys for APIs or something like that. Um, whereas cache is somewhere that you temporarily put something that you're gonna look at uh, shortly that avoids you having to go in back to the source and redo the work to be able to recreate. So that's probably about it. Something, something to add that is um, the, the common use case I have for it is using cache and property services in combination. So property services has quotas on it, number of uh, reads right. So if you are regularly reading tokens or, or something like that, um, to put those into cache uh, means that instead of hitting property services, um, yeah. constantly um, saves you that headache. Um, can can you pass uh, the cache service between scripts? Um, so the only the only way you can, yeah the only way you can do that is through a library because yeah. because it's by script then the cache service and the property service are um, specific to a particular script but it's a library in itself is a script. So that means it's got its own property services and everything else. So if you've got two scripts that share a library, they can pass information via the library's cache because they're both sharing it. So yeah. what it means is the library needs to share back to the whoever's using it um, a link to its own property service or its own cache service. Um, the got a follow-up question in the in the chat. Is there a reason to use cache instead of a variable in a script? Um, I, I don't know what that means. Uh, 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 I guess we don't cache into a variable anyway. If you're, you know, yeah. I mean, a, a cache either starts with being in a variable and it gets written to cache, yeah. or it starts in cache and arrives in a variable. I think the question might have been more to do with um, if a variable is x when you run the script one time and you want it to be x the next time you run it, then the answer is to write it to cache before you go away and to read it back from cache when you. Yeah. when you uh, when you come back again the only thing I'd say is that I mean I've already said that it's limited to a particular period of time but it's also not guaranteed to be there mm. um, so so one of the key things about cache is it should always be a, have a backup plan so in other words if you, you test cache first if it's not there then go you, you also need to know how mm. to get the data as well mm. We're on Google Sites, uh, we're on Google Plus, and we're on YouTube. Um, so uh, we'll put up links to the, the slides we've got, uh, we've used today, uh, and anything else we, we think is useful. Um, so you've got a reference to that. Um, and uh, I think that's about it. So I just want to, huge thanks to um, uh, Romain. Uh, to Steve and Bruce and to Spencer who had to drop out to come fix the server somewhere um, for your contributions to the show. Thank you very much. It's been a, a fascinating discussion. We 
kind of knew before we started this episode that it was going to be a long discussion given the, the amount of information that was released recently and hopefully we've given you a sense of um, uh, what, what's going on and what, what's catching our attention uh, so thank you very much all thank you Martin bye thank you bye